My name is Jackson Healy, but most people call me Jack. I can't believe I've been standing in my bedroom doorway for almost ten minutes now, watching my wife Dakota have sex with some guy I've never seen before. I had enough time to record the event on my iPhone. I was able to take some great pictures. The two lovebirds still didn't notice me, and judging by what was happening on my side of the bed, I had plenty of time to take some more notes. But honestly, it was getting a little repetitive. When I thought about it for a minute, the guy seemed familiar. Maybe because he was very similar to me. That is, he was no younger, no taller, or in better shape than me. Brown hair, blue eyes, ten fingers, and ten toes, just like me. I think you get the point. So what was the appeal? I think the attraction was that the guy she was having sex with wasn't me. I know it's the cliché of clichés, but I returned home a day early from a business trip to find the ever-present strange car in the driveway that led me to this moment. This was another thing that bothered me. Why did my wife make her lover park his car in the middle of our driveway? We live in a house located on a cul-de-sac with 12 other houses. We were a fairly friendly group like most residents of such areas. Was she not worried that someone would find out about her cheating? Finding your wife in your bed with another man is, of course, a shock. But honestly, what hurt the most was that in our 18 years of marriage, Dakota had never, and I mean never, come close to the sexual behavior I had seen her exhibit. Our sex life was pretty vanilla, but satisfying. At least, that's what I always thought until a few minutes ago. She never even hinted that she wanted sex like this. Obviously, she liked it too. I can honestly say that in all the years that I have known her, she has never once said such words in lust or any other situation. I didn't even know she knew those words. I was also not the recipient of any of the other words of encouragement she had been passionately growling into her lover's ear for the past ten minutes. The strangest thing was that I did not feel purple anger. I had no desire to grab a gun and shoot them both or take out one of my daughter's aluminum softball bats and beat them with it. Of course, I was angry, sad, hurt, and confused, as probably any husband in my situation would be. I think the lack of rage was because I had simply accepted that my marriage was over. How else? In time, I'd probably like to know why, but right now it didn't matter. She did it, and it ended our marriage. Case closed. End of story. While wondering what to do next, I noticed that there was an unopened box of Trojans on Dakota's nightstand. Why the hell have rubber bands if you're not going to use them? After we had two daughters, Sheridan, 13, and Helena, 11, Dakota made me wear them until I had a vasectomy. She said two kids was all we needed, but I was hoping to try for a son. I have always regretted that I had not been more assertive on this issue. That's when I noticed something was missing. For as long as I can remember, Dakota had four photographs on her nightstand. I called it her shrine. And now... Two of them were nowhere to be seen. The biggest one was a family portrait we had professionally done when the girls were very little. He was gone, and neither was our wedding photo. I never thought much of it, but our wedding photo was the smallest of the four. I may have to reconsider this opinion. However, she left photographs of our daughters in a prominent place for her lover. What kind of nonsense is this? There was nothing special about them. I think they were just baby pictures she framed years ago. I think these were photos of them from kindergarten. Don't think that the question of where the photographs went was very important now. Maybe I had a shock or some kind of out-of-body experience, but for me, this question became the most pressing. After some thought, I realized exactly where they should be. They should have been in her second drawer. Simply must be. An expensive Drexel Heritage chest of drawers that I sat comfortably next to. I quietly opened the drawer, and sure enough, there they were. How did I know they would be there? Following what I always thought was an unusual habit, Dakota cleaned the house on the day on which cleaning was scheduled. She did this just before the cleaners arrived. In this box, she put everything that was lying around idle or did not have a permanent place. One day I asked her if she thought the cleaners would steal her hairbrush. She gave me a look that looked like, You're driving me crazy. I thought it was just her, but one day at a neighbor's party, in a friendly attempt to embarrass her for this strange habit in front of her girlfriends, I lovingly told several of them about her practice. 
Instead of giggling with me and teasing her, they just looked at me like I was the dumbest person on the planet. Of course, you clean the house before the cleaners arrive. Another thought struck me. Maybe by hiding the photos, she was trying to show me some respect. Somehow, given the circumstances, this is very difficult to believe. Maybe her boyfriend insisted on this. Not knowing exactly why, I carefully and quietly removed the photographs from the drawer. I decided it was time to leave. With two photographs in hand, I slipped out of the house. Since it was only three o'clock, I decided to stop by work. I had been gone for several days, and there was no doubt a stack of meaningless papers on my desk that needed to be sorted through. I arrived and immediately slipped into my office. Surely several colleagues somehow noted my presence, but I did not hear a single greeting. I was focused on locking myself in my office to the exclusion of everything and everyone else. I closed the door behind me. First, I put the two photos I disappeared with on my desk to remind me of, well, I don't know exactly what, but I did it anyway. Gathering my courage, I called my longtime friend Ennis H. Dixon, Esk. He was a family lawyer, but I once knew this playboy as a snobby rich kid. We were roommates in college. One day I asked him why a rich guy like him lived in a hostel with us poor people. He replied that his parents wanted him to associate with people who were below him in social status, so that he understands why he is lucky to be rich. He insisted that I call him Ennis H. When I told him I thought that was a bit pretentious, he simply replied, Well, that's who I am. Ennis H. Dixon must have moved on in his world, because when I called him, I had to go through three subordinates to get to him. That's right. I had to call his office because he refused to give me his cell number. He said his cell phone is for clients only because it makes it easier to track his billable hours. It seemed like it never occurred to him to use two phones. I thought all pretentious idiots had at least two. Jackson, good to hear from you. How can I help you? He never called me Jack just to annoy me. I need your cell phone number, Ennis. Oh, crap, what happened? And I told him everything. As far as I know, they're still doing it in my bed right now. Oh, damn, this is really evil, man. What do you want to do? Divorce, simple and clear. Except I want her and her lover to feel pain. Well, buddy, you're lucky for two reasons. First, I am the best family law attorney in the state. And secondly, you don't live in one of those stupid no-fault states. I'm sure you want primary custody, but I have to say it's not easy. It's not impossible, but it's not easy either. Another thing you need to understand is that even if we prove adultery, she will most likely receive alimony from you. She is a housewife and you earn a lot of money. So even in the guilty state, you can get a good fuck. Let me do this. I'm going to set my investigators on Dakota and her lover. It will be expensive, but if you want custody, we'll need more than just the fact that she had sex with him in your bed. We must know everything about her lover and their affair. Do it. I don't care about the price. You should never say that to a lawyer, Jackson. He must have heard my breath catch in my throat because he paused and became serious. Sorry, Jackson. I didn't mean to take this lightly. I don't want you to apologize, Ennis. I want you to be ruthless. I can be ruthless. This may take several weeks. And for this, I need you to behave normally around your wife for a while. You can do it? Yes. I provided him with the information he needed and emailed him the evidence I had. He sent me a prepayment form. I signed up for DocuSign while we were still on the phone and returned it. I went offline as a much more depressed but determined person. A knock on the door brought me out of my state of self-pity. Come in. My administrative assistant, Franny Graybull, entered hesitantly. Is everything okay, boss? She asked timidly. Yes, Franny. Everything is great. I finished my work early and decided to return home. I know, Jack, but when you brushed past me without returning my greeting or even nodding in acknowledgement, I got worried. Not to mention you've been here for over an hour. Sorry, Franny. I just have a lot on my plate. Franny Graybull has been my assistant for over 15 years. I hired her at the request of my wife. She was an old friend of Dakota's who had fallen on hard times. Franny's husband died in a work accident. 
He was a military man, but he was a non-combatant, so he only had a life insurance policy for $12,000. If he had died in a work hazard, Franny would have received another $100,000, and with two children, $12,000 was not so much. It was hard for her. But I never regretted hiring her, because she turned out to be a truly competent administrative assistant. Hey, okay, Jack, I guess I'll go home. I'm sure she wasn't convinced. She knew me too well. As she was about to leave, she noticed the photographs on her desk and stopped for a moment. What are these new ones? Yes, I decided to bring them here so I can look at them and remind myself why I'm doing this and what's important to me. Oh, that's so nice, boss. Have a nice evening. Bye, Franny. I was going to say something to her because I trusted her with my life, but at the last second I remembered what Ennis said about acting normal and left it as is. How can you behave normally if just a couple of hours ago you saw your wife having sex with someone else on your bed? I knew that going to the hotel would not work. Too many people had already seen me, so I decided that I had better go home. During the 20-minute drive home, my thoughts were working overtime. I kept trying to figure out how to behave normally. I still had no idea how to do this when I pulled up to my garage. Dakota apparently heard my car pull into the garage. She met me at the garage door. I saw several emotions in her eyes. Fear, anxiety, and a little anger all rolled into one. They disappeared as quickly as they appeared. She gave me her best smile. Oh my God, Jack, you're home. We were waiting for you only tomorrow? I thought I would surprise you. I arrived around three and just decided to finish the day at the office. Well, we're glad you're home, honey. She kissed me on the cheek. Dinner will be ready in a few minutes, but there's not much there since I wasn't expecting you. It's okay. I still don't feel very hungry. I'll change out of this suit. It feels like I've been wearing it for weeks. And I started going up the stairs. At that moment, the girls caught up with me. They hugged me, squealing and laughing. We're so glad you're home. We love you, Daddy. I love you guys, too. I miss you so much when I go on these trips. At least I'll have them, I thought to myself. Their greeting gave me courage and directed me in the right direction. I knew I could handle the deception, if only for their benefit. Freed from the little monsters, I continued towards what used to be my bedroom. I don't know what I expected to see, but everything looked normal. The bed linen smelled fresh. The room was clean, but it was unremarkable. Our bedroom was always untouched. Now I understand why this was so. She probably noticed how I was looking at her bedside table in a trance. The two photos were the only thing that was inappropriate. I was trying to control my emotions when her voice startled me. Sorry, honey. I accidentally broke the frames while cleaning. I took them to Aaron Bros to have them restored. I just nodded my head in understanding without looking at her and continued to change my clothes. At some point she left. Oh, and in case you were wondering, she smelled fresh, like a daisy, just like every day I came home. My acting skills weren't the best because Dakota was nervous as a cat throughout dinner and the rest of the evening. I was able to mostly avoid her by spending time with the girls, helping them with their homework. At dinner, which usually took place in a very noisy and cheerful atmosphere, it was terribly quiet. I know the girls suspected something was wrong, but they didn't press it. Dakota, in turn, simply looked at me with an expression on her face that was an unreadable mask. If I was going to pretend to be normal like Ennis wanted, I needed to do a lot better. After the girls settled in for the night, I poured myself a glass of Maker's Mark and lounged in my worn office chair. She called it the Man Cave. It was the only room in the house that I could call my own. She reflected my tastes. I called her warm, inviting, and comfortable. Dakota called her an embarrassment. I knew that I would have to meet her before bed and was wondering how best to do this when Dakota solved this dilemma for me. She came in looking worried, stretching her hands. Under normal circumstances, Dakota would have avoided my room like the plague. She walked towards the sofa opposite my chair. Here, little bunny, sit on my lap, I said as lightly as I could, and he patted his knees. Her face brightened, she quickly jumped off the couch and plopped down on my lap. I quickly kissed her on the cheek. I'm sorry I was so useless at dinner. My trip didn't go as planned and I have a lot of things to get in order, so I took a break. 
she perked up noticeably. It's okay, Jack. I knew something was bothering you. If you give me a chance, then tonight I will make you forget about all your work problems. But the thing is, she didn't make me forget about my problems. Oh, we made good love. And it was the same gentle copulation as always. We always snuggled a lot, and there were signs of satisfaction on both sides. I thought that was what she wanted. It was completely different from what I had seen before. Dakota hugged me tightly and said, You know I love you, Jack. I really do. You made my life complete. I almost threw up on the spot. How could she do this? How can a person change so easily? Her lies and deceit rolled off her tongue as if she were reciting a quiche recipe. I myself found the answer to my question. Because she has been doing this for a long time, that's how. This newfound knowledge sent a chill down my spine and a heaviness settled on my chest. A few moments later, I heard her rhythmic breathing, indicating that she was already asleep. Less than eight hours have passed since she fooled around with her lover in this very bed, and she falls asleep with the snap of her fingers. What kind of person is capable of this? Needless to say, I didn't sleep a wink. I managed to pull myself together to go to work early in the morning. I needed to get out of there before Dakota got up to get the girls ready for school. I left her a short note on the dry erase board in the kitchen that we regularly used for this purpose. I had to leave early for work to start solving the problems I told you about. Somehow, I managed to act quite normally for the next two weeks. As the days passed, waiting for news from Ennis, I began to feel better. Maybe this is how liars become good liars and hide their deeds, just by giving them enough time to practice. Dakota, on the contrary, became more and more anxious. She looked like someone who had a lot on her mind, but she never really said anything to me. She was always affectionate, but seemed to go out of her way to be sensitive. She probably confessed her love to me 25 times a day. She even complimented me on the way I dressed. She should have been alarmed by the missing photos. I mean, they didn't disappear on their own. But for now, she stuck to the principle, do not ask, do not tell. I hoped this would continue for some time. Franny was also acting strange probably because she knew me so well that she could detect the slightest changes in my mood and behavior. She continued to insist, driving me to the point of irritation that I talk about it, but I remained silent. I just told her that I was under pressure at work and that I would be fine. She always knew when I was lying. What also bothered me was that she kept staring at the photographs on my desk. What's the big deal? I have long come to terms with the fact that I am not a very good judge of a woman's mood. I couldn't tell if Franny was sad, worried, or angry, but every time she left my office after looking at the photos, I saw this strange expression on her face. I think women are better at this than men. I seriously began to question my sanity. I didn't feel any of the emotions I thought I should feel. I was just starting to feel dead inside. Every waking moment I felt like there was a 50-pound weight sitting on my chest, making it difficult to breathe. I pretended to live. I needed this nightmare to end quickly. At that moment, Ennis called me and asked me to urgently come to his office. Yes, we took them by the throat. But here's the hard part, Jackson. I need you to brace yourself for impact. She dated Mr. Du Bois a long, long time ago, even before you were married. According to my information, he bragged about having sex with Dakota on the morning of your wedding, a few hours before the ceremony. According to Dubois, Dakota told him she was going to give you sloppy seconds on your wedding night. I should have gone berserk and become a murderer, but all I could think was to say, how did your investigators find out about this? It's better if you don't know, Jackson. Much of the really good stuff we won't be able to use in court anyway. And if I weren't such a good lawyer, we might even get into trouble because of this. He laughed out loud at his attempt at humor. Damn it, kids. I wonder if they are mine. From his look, I realized that there was still a lot of bad news ahead. That's not all, is it? Holy shit, Ennis, maybe she's married to him too. You know, one of those people who leads two different lives with two different families. A bigamist, I think. Oh, Dubois is married but not to your wife. He has his own family. He has been married for 10 years and has three children. 
all under eight years of age. Setting his ass on fire will be easy if you're willing to do it. I don't know, Ennis. I don't want to ruin the life of his wife and children. Well, Jackson, I think you'll be doing his wife and kids a favor. If you watch and listen to the video of Dakota and him, you will see that he is practically tearing you and his wife to pieces. Dakota doesn't really join him in all these conversations, but she doesn't shut him out either. Basically, my people got information that he only married his wife because Dakota didn't want to divorce you to be with him. Ennis, given everything you've learned, why does she want to stay married to me? We haven't figured that one out yet, buddy, but we're working on it. Just give us time, buddy. I can't control myself anymore. When can we serve her? In the very near future, Jackson. But I'm working on something that's worth the wait. Life went on. Dakota was very affectionate. She made the girls behave on their best behavior, and we made love a little more often than before. However, nothing has changed in the manner of our lovemaking. She always looked very happy. I didn't think she was such a good actress that she could pretend to be satisfied all these years. This made her betrayal even more alarming. I was just driving myself crazy, going around in circles, trying to understand her actions. How can she say that and still cheat on me? So I decided it would be better if I faked it myself until I was done with it. What the hell was Ennis waiting for anyway? The following Monday, he called me and asked me to come to his office again. Ennis was one of those people who would make jokes on his deathbed. He never took anything seriously, but looking at him now, I thought he was about to get physically ill. He simply nodded his head slowly. Look, Jack, I, um, I'm not really sure what, I mean, how to tell you this, but it might change your perspective on custody. They're not mine, are they? We won't know for sure until we do a DNA test, but no, I don't think they're yours. But this is even worse. How much worse can it get, Ennis? If they are not biologically mine. They know, Jack. What the hell are you talking about? I interrupted sharply. The girls know that Dubois is their own father. My people got video footage of the four of them. Dubois, Dakota, and the girls. Having a picnic together in the park last Sunday. They called him Dad. He and your wife held hands, kissed and played games with Sheridan and Helena. At that moment, everything went dark. When I came to my senses a few minutes later, I remembered Dakota telling me while I was cleaning the lawn last Sunday that she was going to take the girls to the park. The next thing I knew, Paralegal Ennis was pressing a cold, wet towel to my forehead, and I heard him calling my name. Jackson, what happened to you? You're unconscious. Let me call the paramedics. No, I'll be fine. I shook my head, trying to restore blood flow to the brain. Sorry about that, Ennis. God, it's like my whole life has been a scam. Buddy, you just said the magic word. What word? Fraud. I was thinking that you are a nicer person than me. But if I were you, I would want to really take revenge. I wouldn't be satisfied with warning his wife and divorcing Dakota. I think I will find a way to do this. Did you know that a marriage can be annulled for fraud? We've been married for 18 years, Ennis. How the hell can I have an annulment? In our state, if the marriage was concluded by fraud, the period does not matter. You simply must apply within four years of discovering the fraud. I won't blow smoke up your ass. It won't be easy but it's probably worth a try. If you can get an annulment, you will not have to pay any alimony. You probably won't have to pay child support anyway, but you may, depending on what the judge decides. What? You can't be serious. Child support? Unless we can prove that Dakota and Dubois deliberately and deceived you into raising Dubois's children, there's a chance you'll be stuck. But in fact, this is not the reason I propose to annul the decision. If we file for divorce, your case won't get publicity. But if we file for an annulment after 18 years of marriage, I bet the tabloids and news outlets will write about it. We will publicly shame them both. This will also make our case for the return of child support more feasible. And here I can get my 40%. I can even give you a 5% discount. Plus, you'll get the ruthlessness you asked for. Your generosity is touching, Ennis. She catches me here. I tap my heart. That's not all, Jack. We found some more interesting facts. I listened to everything he had to say, and we began to make plans and say goodbye. By that time, nothing shocked me anymore. 
When I returned to the office, Franny ambushed me. Jack, what happened to you? You look like death warmed over. I'll take you to the doctor right now. No, Franny, but Jack, I said this would be the end of it, Miss Grable. She was shocked by my tone, but reluctantly left. She looked incredibly depressed. I didn't care because I had already been enlightened in Ennis's office. I expected this, and I was not disappointed. Not even thirty minutes had passed after I released Franny when the slender figure of Dakota appeared in the doorway. She was clearly brayless, wearing four-inch heels and cleavage down to her navel. Crap, she was pretty. What a loss. Franny called me. She said something happened. I snorted sarcastically, interrupting her. I tried, without much success, to maintain my composure. I was trying to formulate a cognitive response when I realized she was looking at photographs. She looked for them as if she knew where they should be. She took a deep breath and sat down on one of the chairs in front of my desk. She wasn't wearing any panties either. Does she really think this will help? You were there. You saw us. She looked sad, but her words were spoken with only a slight sense of despondency, mostly in a normal manner. Either way, they cut me to the core. It doesn't mean anything, Jack. It's just a fling. It doesn't compare to what we have together. Tell me something, Dakota. I know it wasn't the first time. How long ago? No, not the first time, honey, but it only lasts a couple of months. She spoke almost sincerely. Two months. How many times? Only three or four times, baby, I think. And never before in our house. I screwed up. It's over. Let's just forget about it. The lie rolled off her tongue without the slightest hint of guilt. She didn't sweat or clench her hands. She didn't look away, didn't even blink. She simply lied, looking me straight in the eye. I realized that she did not intend to give up her boyfriend. Thank you for being honest with me, Dakota. I think most cheaters would just lie and say it was the first time, like drunkards who say, Honestly, officer, I only drank two glasses. But you told me the truth. You gave me the opportunity to look into your soul and see who you really are, and I appreciate it. I had what I hoped was a friendly expression on my face. I noticed only a slight trembling of her eyelids at my last statement, but nothing more. However, she must have sensed something in my expression. Don't do this, Jack. It won't end well for you. You will be hurt in ways you can't even imagine. There is no need for this. Just leave it and let's move on with our lives as we are. I love you, you love me, and we both love girls. Please just leave it. It almost sounds like you're threatening me, Dakota. Oh, honey, I'm sorry if it sounded like that. That's not what I meant at all. What I meant was that you control how much you let my failures hurt you, hurt us. But most of all, Jack, it will hurt Helena and Sheridan. They didn't do anything wrong. I did it. Please, let's talk more about this when you get home tonight. I know I can understand you. Okay, we'll talk about this in the evening. But now I really need to get back to work. She came up to me and planted a hot kiss on my lips. Maybe she mistook me for her boyfriend. We are so good together, baby. Don't let my weakness destroy our family. She turned and smoothly walked out the door, as if she had nothing to do with it. I was so shocked that I sat there in wide-eyed stupor for about five minutes before I pressed the intercom button. Miss Grable, please come in. How long have you known, Miss Grable? You told her about the photographs, didn't you? Silence. She wiped her eyes with a handkerchief, sitting in a chair and looking down. I look forward to hearing from you. She looked up. So, I'm Miss Grable now, Jack, after all these years? Yes, and for now, I'm Mr. Healy. Are you going to fire me, Ja? I mean, Mr. Healy? You know that I really need this job. Now she was openly sobbing. Not if I get a truthful answer from you and you agree to testify under oath to my lawyer. What's your option? I've known for a long time. I reached out in disgust and picked up the office phone. Hi, Georgina. I need to talk to William about a problem. William Bill. Cody was vice president of human resources. Franny interrupted me. Please don't do this. I'm so sorry, Mr. Healy. I knew about this even before you hired me. What did you know, Miss Grable? She returned to her ambiguity. I slammed my palm hard on the table. 
There was a loud bang, almost like a shot. She jumped in surprise. I'm losing patience. You know about her, well, about her activities. I'm tired of these games, Miss Grable. I'm tired of asking questions. Tell me a story, now. I saw her trying to decide whether to tell me the whole truth. I won't accept anything but the complete truth, Franny. I deliberately softened my voice and my attitude. Please, Franny, you owe me this at least for helping you. I'm trying to understand why you betrayed me like this. It took her a few moments to pull herself together. She was close to hyperventilating. Then she told me everything. Byron Dubois was her maternal cousin. She knew about his relationship with Dakota, which began in high school. And she knew that Helena and Sheridan were not my children, and that in fact Dubois fathering the girls was a deliberate act. It went on and on, each revelation being another dagger in my heart. But these knives were not only because of my now evaporated love for Dakota. These were daggers from Franny's betrayal. For some reason, now the betrayal hurts her more. I trusted you completely, Franny. Now I was emotional. Why was Dakota so desperate for me to hire you? To look after you? She wanted me to let her know if you got any closer to finding out about her other life. She lowered her head, as if embarrassed. Is she embarrassed now? She also wanted me to let her know if you ever cheated on her. Her voice was nothing more than a whisper. Oh, for God's sake. I don't know if you can help me, Franny, but do you have any idea why she wanted to marry me in the first place? Not to mention that she was just here confessing her unconditional love for me and begging for us to stay married. You won't believe it, but she really loves you. I chuckled sardonically. Yes, it would be difficult to sell now. It's true, Mr. Healy. I asked her this question myself many years ago. She told me she really loves you, but she needs Dubois. And that's all? She ruined my life because she wanted your cousin? I exclaimed. I was shocked, and Franny shook her head even more. Why children, Franny? Jack, I mean Mr. Healy. I simply pointed my index finger at her, letting her know to continue. Are you sure you want to know? It will be even worse than you can imagine. People tell me this all the time. How much worse can it get, Franny? I use this term often, and it made me feel worse every time. This time was no exception. Her tears stopped. She looked at me with pity, but I knew that she would not lie or even hide anything from me. I had to find out the honest truth. Dakota told me that she asked Byron to get her pregnant so that her children would be born from an alpha male. At this point, she paused and looked at me, gauging my reaction. I guess that means I'm a beta? Yes, she wanted the children to have what she called alpha bloodlines, but she wanted the betas, that is you, to raise them to be kind and compassionate. She knew that in the long run, your character would be better suited to raising her children, and Byron agreed with her. She also told me that she needs both an alpha and a beta to live fully. I couldn't help myself and started laughing uncontrollably. It was too ridiculous. I let Franny go after telling her that I was going to make an appointment for her to see Ennis and that I expect the whole truth from her. She just nodded her head in understanding and headed towards the door. She stopped and turned to me. What do you want me to tell Dakota, Mr. Healy? You can call him Jack, Franny. I really don't care what you tell her. It doesn't matter anymore. Good night. Wait. Not that I care, but do you think I'm a beta? She started crying again. Yes, but it's not bad. That's all, Miss Graybull. She sobbed turned and hurriedly left, closing the door behind her. I didn't know what I was going to do, but I knew I wasn't going home. I took the chance that my friend Butch was still in the office and called her. I was lucky and went to her office. I have to tell you about Butch. Her name is actually Cheyenne Gillette, and she is the Director of Information Technology. She is a retired U.S. Navy commander. Rumor has it that, as a young woman, she became the first woman to qualify for the Bud's Naval School but due to a torn knee, her chances were dashed. She is tough as nails and doesn't get close to anyone at work. She is a committed lesbian and proud of it. She doesn't like being called a lesbian, although one day she told me, if you're going to call me lesbian, make sure you capitalize L, but I prefer queer as long as you smile when you say it. I didn't pretend to understand any of this, but I was her friend, pretty much the only one she had at work. 
This happened because one day I saw some Neanderthal accosting her outside the break room. When she had enough, she physically pushed him away in an attempt to get away from him. Now I have a policy of live and let live. At least that's what I used to stick to when it came to people's choices and preferences. This asshole crossed the line, and in my opinion, he definitely deserved it and more. When she looked at me, all the color disappeared from her face. She released that she could be in deep shit. A company director pushing an employee is usually frowned upon unless you are related to the owner. I calmly said, You know, Miss Gillette, he shouldn't have pushed you like that. Are you okay? She gave me a quick smile, leaned over and whispered something in the asshole's ear. She said as she passed me, Call me Butch. All my friends do this. For three days, this asshole didn't call and didn't show up. He was fired and was never heard from again. And that was the end of it. We remained friends. I thought I had screwed up when I accidentally called her Butch in a management meeting one day. You could have heard a pin drop and I thought my career was over. She didn't bat an eyelid. She immediately replied, Okay, Sundance, and everything was fine. If you were Butch's friend, you became a friend for life. Damn, Sundance, you look like crap. Sundance became a standard greeting for me after that incident. What's happening? There are rumors around the office that there is a lot of drama going on at your end of the world. That's putting it mildly, Butch. Emotionally devastated, I sank into a chair. I need to rest somewhere for a while. Can I hide with you and Becky? Becky was her partner for 17 years. Of course, Jack. I will have to coordinate this with her, but I don't see a problem. We have a lot of space. Care to tell me about it? I pretty much laid out the situation to her. I didn't miss much, but when I told her what Franny had done and that I was going to fire her, she raised her hand to stop me. You can't fire her, Jack. At the very least, you'll expose us to a wrongful termination lawsuit. It might be worse if she says that you are taking revenge on her for her personal problems not related to work. I don't know if she can do it, but you can't afford to risk it. Bullshit, Butch so she can just set me up after what she did? Relax, Jack. I have a better idea. Just make an agreement with Bill about her transfer. I need a new administrator. Butch gave me a really wicked smile. And raise her salary. Then she won't be able to say that you were stalking her. You said she needs money. I couldn't help myself. Returning to her smile, I laughed. This was the first good news. And perhaps it will mark the beginning of my recovery on the long road back. You see... Butch had been here for about five years, and during that time she had gone through twelve. No, it must have been thirteen administrative assistants. And that's not even counting those who simply quit after learning that they would work for her. The first few people she went through tried to file all sorts of complaints and lawsuits. None of them were successful because Butch didn't treat anyone any differently than she treated herself. She kept impeccable records and did not tolerate any complaints. Among the administrative staff, she was known as the Angel of Death, because if you worked for her, you were a dead man walking. That evening at their house, I had to tell the whole story again for Becky. Her only reaction was a constant sympathetic shake of her head. Butch seemed to get even angrier. I was glad she was on my side. Having calmed down a little after finishing the story, I told them about my conversation with Franny after Dakota left. Oh, this quiet girl will really like working for me, Jack. I decided it would be a short story. Since I love punishment, I asked them about Franny's comment about the beta. This is a masculine trait, right? Butch rolled her eyes at me. Of course you're a beta, Jack. God, do you really want to know what a beta male is? He is an amazing lover because he cares about what his partner wants in bed. He remains faithful and is a wonderful father to his children. He can have conversations with his wife that do not concern their sex life. A beta male cares deeply about his family. He does sometimes wash his clothes and clean up after himself. He is reliable and not a control freak. He is not threatened by either his friends or his wife's independence. There are a million other things, Jack. Franny wasn't insulting you. She was complimenting you. But what about Dakota's comment about the alpha gene? At this point, Becky intervened. You'll have to ask Dakota about that. 
You know that in any case you will have to do this, at least for your peace of mind. I don't pretend to understand her motives for doing what she did, but I can understand her thought process. What? You... Relax, Jack, let me explain by asking you a question. Do you think Butch is Alpha or Beta? Definitely an Alpha. You're wrong. She may be an Alpha at work, but at home she's definitely a Beta. Why do you think I was with her all these years? When she's at home, she's just like a Beta. This really surprised me. I looked at Butch. She smiled wryly and nodded her head. That's right, Jack. I'm the Alpha in our partnership. Butch allows me to control our relationship both in and out of bed. She's an alpha. No, that's not quite right. She has to be an alpha at work, which allows her to be a beta at home. She needs both to be complete. And Jack, the truth is that we all move between alpha and beta personality characteristics depending on our circumstances. Unless, of course, you are a sociopath. Butch's eyes were wet. She looked at Becky with loving admiration. I knew they were kindred spirits. I remembered a similar look from Dakota. God, I wonder if this is true. Men can probably do the same, but as a rule, women are better at separating the situation. I think Dakota was telling Franny the truth when she told her she needed both of you to be whole. At that moment, Butch stood up, sat on Becky's lap, and they began to kiss passionately. I started apologizing and got up to leave. Don't go, Jack. They spoke at the same time. We will behave well, and they laughed, embarrassed. It's true, Jack. Becky is my soulmate, but she runs the show here. How do you feel about all this? It took me a long time to collect myself and formulate my thoughts. This insight was new, and it made my brain hurt. But I came to understand the contradiction that was in my life. You know, after listening and observing your communication, I really believe that she loves me and needs me. But the problem is that instead of being honest about the life she needed at the beginning of our relationship, she turned my life into a lie. And she did it for her own selfish reasons. She knew I wouldn't do it, so to get what she wanted, she lied to me. I will never forgive her for this. So what's next, Jack? What about your children? I have to believe that they love you too. And you told us that you love them? You can't just turn them off because of what their mother did. I don't know, Butch, I just don't know. I know that Dakota and I are getting a divorce, and nothing on this earth will make me change my mind. I know it's petty, and it could end my relationship with Helena and Sheridan, but I'm going to hurt Dakota and her lover, and it hurts bad. Out of curiosity, what do you both think of Franny's role in this mess? Becky was silent, but Butch spoke up. I don't know if this makes sense, Sundance, but in some ways her betrayal seems even worse to me. I mean, your wife is who she is. I think that for all of Dakota's flaws, her actions were dictated by her internal ideas about love, need, and compassion. But Franny's betrayal was cunning, calculating, and unforgivable. Leave it to me. I nodded my head, knowing that they understood. Guys, I'm going to bed. Thanks for letting me spend the night here. My cell phone buzzed all night, indicating a text or call from Dakota. I never read, listened to, or responded to any of the more than 20. The next day in the office, I worked through the issue of Franny's transfer. She was scheduled to start work as Butch's assistant on Monday. May God have mercy on her soul. In the meantime, she was sent home with her salary until the end of the week. I was still living with Butch and Becky. I was very grateful to them, and they seemed in no hurry to get rid of me. I completely ignored all of Dakota's attempts to contact me. What's the point of this? I instructed security to keep Dakota away from the office and parking lot. A few days after this, an unexpected visitor came to my office. It was Montana, Dakota's older sister. It's probably my fault for forgetting to mention Montana to security. Montana never treated me warmly, and I probably didn't treat her either. When she was next to me, she had a perpetual grin on her face. It's like she knows something that I don't. Since I no longer had an administrative assistant, she showed up unannounced in my office with her signature grin. Maybe today I can wipe it off my face forever. What do you need, Montana? It's like I don't know. Can I at least come in and sit down, Jack? Of course, but don't get too comfortable. You won't be here long. I pointed her to a chair. 
Look, Jack, I know you and I haven't been the best of friends over the years, but please listen to me for a few minutes, and then I'll get off you. There was still a hint of arrogance in her voice, as if she were talking to a petulant ten-year-old child. You know she loves you, Jack, and she will do anything to correct her mistake. Do you believe that she loves you? I tried my best to suppress my laughter, but it still came out. You know, Montana, I really believe that she loves me, but it doesn't matter. I feel nothing but contempt and disgust for her. Anything else? I am really busy. You're an idiot, Jack. You always have been. I don't know what she saw in you. Well, at least we agree on this, Montana. I don't know what she saw in me either. I spat it out with as much disgust as I could muster. I didn't come to argue, Jack. Since you don't want to talk to her, she wrote this letter for you. She leaned across the table and handed me a thick, white envelope. I took the letter from her. On the front, in Dakota's handwriting, was written, For my dear Jack. I sighed and stood up. With great enthusiasm, I approached the shredder. I placed the unopened letter in it, all the while keeping my eyes on Montana. Now a grin was on my face. You're a stupid, childish boy, Jack. You are bringing a lot of pain on yourself and your family. She spat nails as she stomped toward the door. Hey, Montana, before you go, do you want to tell me about Brockton Bozeman? She froze midway. She slowly turned to me. I do not know what you're talking about. Her arrogance disappeared and her voice became desperati. Her angry fatsedi was quickly crumbling. Surly your husband Troy would be interested in... No, Jack, please. She was falling apart. This has nothing to do with Troy. I... I... I was just trying to help Dakota. She really loves you. Tears rolled down her cheeks. I think she already knew that the end was near for her. Is there really nothing I can do? You have a week, Montana. If you don't tell Troy everything or try to somehow hide the truth about your other life, he will get everything. All the evidence I have, and I have a lot of it. He'll get it either way, but since I'm such a nice guy, I'm giving you a week to see if you can sell Troy your lifestyle. But if by the end of the week he doesn't come to me in person and say that he doesn't care about all this, he will get everything. Jack, please, I know you don't believe me, but I really love Troy. He means everything to me. Yes, I've heard this before. In about five minutes, she went from an arrogant bitch to a sad child. I even felt a little guilty for doing it. No matter how strange it may seem to you, Montana, I believe you. True, I believe it. That's why I'm giving you a week. If I didn't believe that you loved him, he would simply receive a rather large package at work tomorrow. Jack, no, I beg you. Are your two boys really his children, Montana? Please, Jack, you don't understand. Everything is not what you think. Please let me explain. Looks like I got my answer. You have a week. Goodbye, Montana. Please close the door when you leave. I started rummaging through the papers on my desk. I couldn't look at her anymore. I didn't really know Troy that well, but he deserved to know. You see, the Ennis people discovered that Montana, who was a couple of years older than Dakota, was living the same lifestyle. Maybe Dakota got the idea from her, or maybe they both got it from their mother or from Cosmo. Who knows? It didn't matter. I heard the door close. I picked up the phone. Yes, Ennis, burn them. Music to my ears, buddy, music to my ears. But Jackson, you're going to have to make some decisions, and they won't be easy. None of this has been easy so far, Ennis. What now? He was very measured in his answer. I think an annulment is a win-win option. Based on the evidence we've collected and Franny's sworn statement, that's not a problem. We must file your petition along with the annulment affidavit and then serve it on her. It couldn't be easier. I'm going to make it loud. I will make sure that all interested media receive information about this. But if we do this, you will give up all visitation custody rights to your children. You won't have to pay alimony or child support. It will look like the girls were never in your life. He paused for a moment. Unless, of course, Dubois and she allow you to visit them, which is unlikely after we burn their carcasses. I can't let you leave me halfway, Jackson. Either you stay in this until the end, or we just file for divorce and you leave much poorer. What will you choose, partner? Damn, things are only getting worse. 
Damn, Ennis, I need to think. I'll contact you in a couple of days. Okay, Jackson, but I'm ready to go now. Let me know. I loved my girls. At first, when I heard them call Du Bois Daddy, I was angry with them. Then I realized that all they knew was that they had two dads who loved them. It wasn't their fault. Who knows what Dakota told them? To be honest, I didn't know which way to go. I discussed it with Butch and Becky when I got home that evening. They didn't give me an answer one way or another. I couldn't blame them. I still haven't decided which way to go. But because of the girls, I was leaning toward divorce. And then Dakota made my decision easier. She talked to Montana. What a shock. After work, I went for a drink at the Horse's Head Bar and Grill. I had no idea why it was called that. There was not a single thing related to horses. But it was usually quiet there, and I needed it to sort out my thoughts alone. But this did not happen. My thoughts were rudely interrupted. Hello, Jack. Dakota. We need to talk, Jack. But first I want to show you something. Please come outside with me. She didn't wait for an answer. She simply headed toward the door. What the hell? I put a 20 in my glass, waved to the bartender, and went to get it. Once outside in the still bright late afternoon sun, after our eyes had adjusted, she pointed at the Chevrolet SUV. Do you see them, Jack? I glanced around the parking lot, closing my eyes. I saw the asshole Dubois with Sheridan and Helena sitting inside. Dubois had a sour expression on his face, but he did not look directly in my direction. He simply looked straight ahead. But I clearly saw my girls. They looked at me desperately and cried. Dubois started the engine and drove away. God, what has Dakota done? In a voice full of venom, she made the decision for me. If you and I don't come to an understanding right here and now, Jack, this will be the last time you see your daughters. If you divorce me, you know I'll get custody. Oh, you'll get visitation rights, but I'll do my best to make sure that doesn't happen. I will blame you for destroying our family. By the time I'm done, they'll never want to see you again. Despite everything that had happened, I was stunned by her audacity. Not for doing it, but for dragging Sheridan and Helena into it. What do you want, Dakota? I want us to be together again, Jack. I want my family back. You just have to come to terms with the reality of Byron being in my life. I know they are not my daughters, Dakota. Of course they are your daughters, Jack. I love two men, and I never knew for sure which one was the biological father, but I knew that you were the best man who could raise them. You're still lying to me, Dakota. I can always tell when you do it. That's not true, Jack. What makes you think that you can determine that? Because your lips always move when you lie. It took her a moment to realize this. Jack. Get away from me, you stupid, vindictive bitch. See you in court. I headed straight to my car. As I was leaving, I called Ennis. Go ahead. Annul the marriage, Ennis. I'm with you until the end. Yes, and burn that piece of crap, too. Dubois. I hung up before he could answer. It was clear to me that no matter what choice I made, she would use girls as weapons against me. I had no choice. It was time to put an end to this. Maybe in a few years I will be able to somehow talk some sense into Sheridan and Helena. I had no idea what might happen after Dakota was sued, so I moved out of Butch and checked into a hotel. I have already taken care of all the administrative and financial matters. Ennis was going to serve her with a temporary restraining order. He told me it would only be in place for a few weeks and then we would have to go to a hearing to make it permanent. Of course, permanent in our state meant three years. But Ennis had high hopes that, having received the order, she would immediately violate it by coming to my work to curse me. Or, better yet, hit me. He thought it would be really cool if she bled me or broke one of my bones. He said if she did as he hoped, it would make the standing order a win-win. Sometimes I doubted whose side he was on. All that now remained to be done was to hand her the documents and wait for the hearing. Two days later, Dakota did exactly as Ennis had hoped. She rushed past the security desk, burst into my office, and began throwing things while swearing like a sailor. 
She slapped me several times before the guards were able to subdue her and take her into custody for the police. Ennis was disappointed that she didn't hurt me more, but he figured we could make the order permanent anyway. A divorce hearing was scheduled in 60 days. Ennis was a man of his word. He made sure that all the media knew when, where, and what would happen. Dakota's lawyer tried to have the hearing closed to the public, but the judge was ready for a re-election, so he denied their request. Ennis was right. An annulment was a win-win situation. But he dragged out the hearing and, showing surprisingly good acting skills, gave it as much drama as possible. I got a cancellation, he got a talk show, and the gossip got increased ratings. Six days after talking with Montana, her husband Troy visited me. Damn, I'm just not as strong as you, Jack. I love her and want to give her a chance. Our children are grown up and will soon be leaving for college, but I still need them in my life. On top of that, I'm too old to start over. He was very emotional. Couldn't you just keep the evidence to yourself? I'm afraid that if I saw them, I wouldn't be able to overcome it. There was confusion in his voice. Maybe I'll need them later. Of course, you know that the children are not yours, right? She told you about this, didn't she? He just nodded his head in agreement. Troy, is she still planning on sleeping with her second husband? He shook his head, but looked down at his feet. My boys, Jack, I am their father, regardless of who the sperm donor was. I just can't give them up. And she says no, that she will give up this lifestyle if I stay with her. It's weird, I know, but I think she really loves me. Hmm, that was different. I understand, Troy. And perhaps you really are stronger than the two of us. I just can't leave it, you know? He solemnly shook his head in understanding, shook my hand, and left. I never saw him or Montana again. I heard they moved out of state as soon as their two children graduated from high school. On the same day that I met Troy, Mrs. Byron Dubois received a rather thick and heavy package from FedEx. Things went very quickly for Mr. Dubois. Perhaps this was a mistake on my part, because when the court ordered Dubois to pay back my child support a few months later, he no longer even had a potty to pee in. I thought Ennis was going to have a heart attack when he found out he would only get 40% of $250 a month. Yes, he was so angry that he took back his promise of a 5% discount. However, he calmed down when I asked him how much he gets for his talk show. About six months after the annulment, I contacted Dakota and asked if we could meet to talk. Everyone told me I needed closure. Whatever it was, I had questions. We met at the horse's head. Are you kidding me? After what you did to Byron and me? It'll be a cold day in hell before you see my girls. If you so much as whisper anything to them, I will put a ban on you so quickly your head will spin. After what I did to you? You're a little delusional. I had to take a deep breath because getting into a shouting match was not an option. What if I lift the restraining order and agree to fund the girls' college education? I know you and Byron are surviving. As you said, they are not to blame for anything. I know you want them to have the opportunity to go to a good college. I saw that she was softening. I don't know, Jack. Listen, Dakota. I'll even babysit if you want to go away for the weekend or something. I know they're at an age where they don't need it, but I'm just trying to be able to keep them in my life, to show them that I still love them, and I won't lie to you, maybe to explain why I acted the way I did. I promise I won't talk bad about you. Let me just say that you wanted to lead a different lifestyle from mine, and we both decided that it would be better if we went our separate ways. Let me think about it. The tone of her voice dropped to an almost normal level. Do you mind, Dakota, if I ask you a few questions? It's probably not a big deal, but it bothers me and I'd like answers. Please tell me the truth. It won't undo anything that's been done. Whatever, Jack. She started to get impatient. Her behavior infuriated me. But as far as she was concerned, I didn't need much. Why? You actually ruined my life, and for what? She let out an indignant sigh. You did this to yourself, Jack. She felt that I was ready to explode, and raising both hands, she continued to speak. I know. I know. It was my actions that separated us, but it was you who used scorched earth on me. 
I had no choice. You tore out my soul and fed it to the wild dogs. What did you expect from me? When you found out, I, of course, expected that you would be hurt. But I thought we would sit down and talk about it like adults and figure it out somehow. You know, Troy and Montana are still together, right? People talk. Jack, solve their problems. To be fair, Dakota, Montana told him she would leave her lover, not that I believed her, to try to make their marriage normal. You told me that I would have to come to terms with Byron's presence in your life. It was obvious that this hurt her. She changed tactics. I didn't mean to hurt you, Jack. You have to admit that until the moment you saw Byron in me, you thought you had a wonderful life. I helped you find this life. I loved you deeply. My heart broke when you left me. Well, that raises a really big question. Why did you need both of us? I don't know, Jack. She took a deep, slow breath. My sister did it, and some of my friends did too. You may not know it, but this lifestyle is becoming more and more acceptable. Oh, please. I snorted mockingly. Then why not discuss this with me openly before we get married? Oh, and by the way, did you actually have sex with Dubois on our wedding day? First of all, who told you this? This is a complete lie. I would never do that. She really looked incredulous. Secondly, if I told you, would you agree to the wedding? No, you wouldn't do that. And I loved you very much. But sometimes I just wanted sex. Don't get me wrong. I loved what you did to me in bed. But you just didn't have it in you to take me and not worry about me getting hurt. I understood that she was sincere, if not delusional. It was obvious that I wouldn't get anything resembling a satisfactory answer, so I moved on. What could she say that would make sense? Why did you have to have sex with him in my bed? I know you won't believe me, but this was the first and only time we ever did this in our house, let alone a bed. It definitely raised my eyebrows, but somehow I believed her. Well, then why that time? She sighed again but this time with sadness. Byron and his stupid alpha tendencies. He just needed to push, and in a moment of weakness, I gave in. Stupid, stupid, stupid. She was close to tears. By the way, about alpha and beta? Oh, God, Jack, maybe you'll leave it alone. You were a wonderful husband, father, and lover. Then why children? And don't tell me it wasn't intentional. I know better. She at least had the decency to look guilty before answering. Jack, you're basically an anonymous middle manager in a mid-sized company. For heaven's sake, you drive a minivan. Your idea of fun is sitting at home in your terrible man cave watching sports on TV. Byron's idea of entertainment is to charter a plane and fly to the game, or fly to Vegas for the weekend. Byron drives Corvettes and owns, or at least used to own, his own successful business. This lifestyle is intoxicating, but not beneficial in the long run. Yes, but you are with him, not with me. I'm afraid it won't last long. Is it true? Yeah, living with that arrogant asshole full-time is a whole lot different than having him around part-time. Besides, he's a terrible father, just as I suspected. I really don't feel sorry for you, Dakota. What a lousy situation. I wanted to strangle her. You made your own bed. Listen, Jack, I know I screwed up big time with that little escapade at the bar with the girls. It was stupid of me, I know, but I was completely desperate and decided that I had nothing to lose. God, how I wish I could undo this part, if not everything else. She fell silent for a moment, and as for me, I didn't feel any better about this conversation, so to hell with the ending. I started to get up and leave. Jack, wait. She grabbed my hand. I still love you and I always will. I want you to know that if you come back to me, everything will work out. I promise that I will never see Byron again and will spend the rest of my life doing everything I can to make it up to you. I pulled my hand away from her, stood up, and looked down at her. Sorry, Dakota. It's too late for that. Thank you for agreeing to meet with me. Think about what I said about girls. Goodbye, Dakota. Jack, wait. Please don't leave. I need you in my life. I didn't even look back. I never received a response from Dakota regarding my proposal for girls.
Hell, I didn't know if she was still with Dubois or living on the streets. I didn't really care. But the ignorance about Helena and Sheridan continued to gnaw at me, sometimes driving me into a frenzy. They were innocent pawns in this story. Did I do the right thing? I was sitting at my favorite neighborhood dive bar, Emilio's. I was already sipping my second jack and soda when Emilio put another one in front of me and shook his head in exasperation. Almost two years had passed since the annulment, and I was still feeling sorry for myself. I knew that if I didn't tip so well, he would have kicked me out of his bar a long time ago. Every evening when I came, which was almost always, he greeted me the same way. Amazing, here comes Mr. Sunshine. Try not to suck the life out of my place again today, okay, Jack? Apparently, he felt that I was not exactly the life of the party. Drinks paid for by the lady at the end of the bar. He jerked his head to the left. Are you going to go cry on her shoulder and basically make a fool of yourself? She'll run away from this place like everyone else, and it'll cost me money, you idiot. And he walked away, muttering to himself. And here I thought, Emilio had replaced Ennis as my best friend. I looked back and saw Franny approaching. That was a surprise. I stood frozen in place, looking at her. I only saw Franny in the company building a couple of times. I tried not to even notice her existence, but one day she cornered me near the break room. I'm not leaving, Jack. This bitch can fire me if she wants, but I'm not going to give her a reason. I won't give you that pleasure. And she left. I immediately went to Butch's office. I was beside myself with rage. Why is this bitch still here? Calm down, Sundance. I treat her the same as any other administrative assistant I've ever had. She's simply the best I've ever seen. She accepts everything I do to her. If she fails, she fails. But Franny will stay as long as she delivers. And there she stood before me, still an administrative employee of Butch. It was definitely a record. Her resilience finally killed my hatred for her. I simply perceived it as an invisible part of a past life. Hello, Jack. How are you? When I didn't answer, she continued. Do you think we could talk? I paused for a long time. Maybe it's time. Yes, Franny. I think we can do it. Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think about listening to the next one. Listening to the next one. Listening to the next one.